Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. What's going on? Well, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Pinnacle Overlanders. Yeah. What can you buy today and literally leave the lot and drive around the world? Like, you know, we're, we're big fans of the G-Wagon. You know, the G-Wagon has global motor packages now in the United States. We don't get the, the, the turbo diesel engines we never have. I mean, I guess until relatively recently in the car's history, we never even got the G-Wagon. But if you buy a new G-Wagon today, you can get that serviced with a mechanic that actually knows what's going on in Kazakhstan or Cambodia yeah. or or wherever. Because Mercedes International Service and International Parts Network is, I mean, second, I mean, better than Toyota. People always think Toyota is the best, but, um, you know, Toyota uses a lot of, you know, regional drivetrain packages. Let's think of the Tacoma, for example. Yeah. It has that three and a half liter Atkinson cycle engine, which... That engine is is primarily built for the U.S. I want to say in Japan, it's in the Toyota Alphard. You're not going to find, well, one, you're not going to find a windshield when you break it somewhere. Yep. And you're not going to be able to fix that engine without air freighting parts in. And a lot of times that's just not an option. I mean, people think we live in this really connected world, but you're going to end up in a lot of countries where used car parts or car parts have a 500% tariff. Right. And they're going to get held up at customs for a week or two weeks. And I, I, I know friends that were in South America that were like, had to fly back and, and smuggle a transmission in with them because I think they were in Colombia or something. And it just, it wasn't an option. It was like, cheaper to fly home, get the parts they needed and fly back. And that, yeah. that's, that's the reason why we're focusing on these truly being pin, pinnacle, which means does it meet all of the minimum requirements that we have for an overland vehicle for international travel, which means does it have sufficient payload? Is it capable in technical terrain? Um, does it have a reputation of durability and reliability? Yeah. And if you look within every brand, there's going to be a vehicle that rises to the top in that regard, even in the United States. I mean, we don't get some of the coolest overland vehicles in the world. We don't get a Y61 patrol. We don't get a 70 series Land Cruiser, yeah. but we do get vehicles that are pinnacle overlanders that are available in most countries of the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And the reason why we really want to focus on, on models that are available around the globe is because of service and support. Um, one of the cool things about a Mercedes, if you buy a new G wagon, you actually not only have your warranty, that's good for however many months and how many, ever many miles in your home country, but it's also good for 12 months, unlimited miles globally. So you could, you could drive your new G wagon into into South Africa and rock up at the dealership in Joburg and actually get the truck properly serviced, and and that's actually a huge advantage. When we did the the big trip with the seventy series trucks, when we went to all seven continents, Toyota provided us with that same kind of a support. They said for twenty four months you've got service and support at any dealership. Now, of course we never needed it because we were, yeah, they were seventies. They, they were seventy series. Yeah. Cause they were Lankers. We literally never needed to go to a dealership for a repair. We did lots of oil changes, but you know, we never, we never needed to have anything fixed. I mean, I, I don't even think a piece of plastic broke, but um, those are, those are certainly exceptional vehicles. But when we look at what's available in the United States, I think it's kind of important to start with what is, you know, arguably the most pinnacle vehicle available in the United States, which is the 200 series Land Cruiser. Yeah. I think people need to realize how cheap Land Cruisers are here. Yeah. You know, they are 25 or 30% more expensive in Australia. They're, they're, they're cheap here and we get top spec Land Cruisers. You know, what we're paying for uh, something with air conditioned seats internationally would be called a Sahara spec. You're, mm-hmm. you're probably getting the working model. You know, yep. overseas, some people will complain about that. I will just smile and take the air conditioned seats. Yeah. Um, you know, but the, the, the point being, yeah, it's not the, a reason not to buy the car. Yeah, right? exactly. Like the point being with the 200 series, whether, you know, you're getting the luxury version here in the United States or, you know, the UN spec version, you know, in Africa, the, they're the same bones underneath, you know, that five, seven motor is pretty phenomenal. Like I don't know anybody that's ever had issues with it. You know, there, there are going to be countries where that, where that engine just was not available, where maybe the Mercedes is a better for availability, but I would argue all day that for, for what you're losing with, with the, the small amount of, of decrease in availability from Toyota, you're making up in, in, in reliability. Yeah, um, you, you absolutely are. 
And Toyota does have the most prolific dealer network, only followed by closely, very closely by Mercedes. If you yeah. look at any any developing country, even a third world country, there are bureaucrats in those places that want to drive new Mercedes. It's a, yep. it's a status symbol. Um, so you do find good Mercedes infrastructure throughout the world. And I, I think the five, seven actually has a couple advantages. The biggest disadvantage is fuel economy. Yes. Um, if you were to get the, the VDJ 200, which is the twin turbo uh, 4.5 liter V8 diesel, that is going to have uh, about 40% better fuel economy. Yeah, and it can be significant. Tuned, yeah. And it can be tuned to even better than that um, while also gaining performance. So you can get very close to the same acceleration performance of the five, seven, out of that diesel while also maintaining much better fuel economy. But we don't get that. We don't get that motor. And, and that diesel is an ultra low sulfur engine. It, it is. And so even if we got that diesel, it would be more limiting for international travel than the 5.7 yeah. would be. So I think we're, we're at this crossroads where we just kind of got to accept gasoline engines for a while. Um, and maybe even for long term, if you look at how efficient the new Ranger is with yeah, turbocharging your engine. That's almost 300 horsepower. That's right. Turbocharging 10 speed automatic transmissions. All of that is really also improved fuel economy and yeah. reduced emissions. Uh, and it's funny. People will often say, Oh, you always want diesel because it's the fuel that's going to be available everywhere. In my experience as a traveler, that is true to some degree, but I've never found gasoline to be less available. And the reason for that is because all of the locals ride motorcycles. Motorcycles yep. don't run on diesel. Yeah. Little I mean, scooters in the middle of the jungle in Vietnam, you know, you're not going to, you may not see an over the road truck. Yeah. You, you may not even be able to access like, a village by a truck. Like land cruisers are luxury vehicles, yeah, even when sure. they're used in, in a utility sense in, right. a, in a less fortunate country. Gas, you know, pe people are driving Kias. Yeah. They're, they're driving you know, Chinese cars that we haven't even heard of most of the time. And, and generally they're all, they're all gasoline. Engines. A, lo a lot of them are. And so uh, fuel availability has never been an issue. I, when I drove across the Silk Road in that little chimney, that was a gasoline truck. Yeah. I mean, in the, the deepest, darkest Tajikistan, I still could find Oh man, gas should we have a chimney on this list? Yeah. We, oh yeah. I know. We're we just really, they're really space efficient, but we don't get we them. We don't get us. I, I know. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Maybe That's on the international list. But, yeah, we'll have to talk about that. But back to the 200, I mean, you're looking at something. I mean, Scott, I, I remember a while ago, you told me you were talking with a Land Cruiser engineer. Yeah. And they said that the 200 was the strongest Land Cruiser that they had ever made. That's true. It was actually the, the lead engineer for Land Cruiser when I was at the Nagoya plant. Um, and he just, he reinforced the fact that the Land Cruiser is their pinnacle truck. It's the one that's yeah. the most durable, the front end, even though it's independent suspension is significantly stronger than a 70 series. And I would say that for me, it's the 200 series is the one vehicle that I've literally flip flop my opinion on. If I, when yeah. that vehicle first came out in 2008, um, I appreciated it for what it was, but it was still, we were still in the era that the 80 series was the answer to everything. Um, and you could still buy low mileage 80 series Land Cruisers in, they would have only been 10 years old yeah. when the 200 came out. And the 100 series is obviously a very excellent vehicle as well. But I remember when the 200 came out, it felt round and it felt soft and it felt yeah, too big. it felt like big. a Highlander. It felt too big and, and uh, it felt somewhat soulless, but a lot has changed in the market in the last 10 years. Yeah. A lot of those vehicles that were boxy and cool have, have changed. They've gone away. And when you look at it now, the 200 series is like, yeah, that would absolutely be a vehicle I would buy and leave and drive around. Yeah, the world I think in. it's, I think it's, it's, it's a smart purchase. They're obviously quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say they're about 80, 80 to 90 80 now, grand, yeah. but, and you're, you're getting something that will, have great resale. You'll, you'll drive it around the world and it'll still be worth something. Yep. You know, I, 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 I think there's some vehicles out there that just won't put up with the, the lifetime of punishment. And, and, you know, you kind of touched on the 80 and the, and the hundred, we're not saying that those aren't bad choices, but you know, what we're saying is that, you know, the 80 series is almost a classic car. Yeah. Like I have one, I love it. That's the car that I take on, on my serious trips, but you're, a Toyota dealer is not going to stock parts for a, you know, a 25 year old car. No. And like, they're going to be hard. They're going to be hard parts to find. And you'll, you'll, you start to get outside of the operational window of even a Land Cruiser. Land Cruisers yeah. are, are designed to be reliable, reliable at that half a million mile mark. Um, yes. Once you get over 20 years or so, 
all the wiring becomes brittle. All of the, the rubber and the seals and the Everything. pesky heater hose and all that other stuff. And the parts are not cheap. They're not I cheap. I mean, yeah. they're, they're great vehicles, but yeah, I would just take a 200 now. Like yeah. They're, they're very capable. And it's not to discourage anybody from buying or driving what they want. I just think that we have to get out of that mindset that the 80 series is the solution for driving around the world. Yeah. There are better choices today yes. for that for that exercise. And it would, at the top of my list personally, would be the 200 series. Yeah, I think push comes to shove out of everything we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I would still choose G-Wagon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah so, 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 so why would you pick the, the G-Wagon? What, what, uh. I mean, you and I, we both, we both drive cars like that. And, and what's your, what's your thought on the G wagon? You know, I, I don't know exactly. It's, 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 it's hard to pinpoint. I think that of all of the vehicles on this list that are actively being used by, you know, the G wagon is the only one that's actively being used by, by militaries. It's the only one that is, has international, like true international serviceability in, in, in a lot of countries. You know, here, the G wagon is that post Malone wrote a song about it. Like yeah. it's, it's kind of a, a hippity hop Kardashian car, but underneath it's the same thing that the Canadian military is using. Yep. It's the same thing that the Australian military is using. It's the same thing that a lot of European militaries use. Um, it is, it is legit. I mean, there's, there's four different body coatings that go on to the, the, the body of that vehicle before it's painted. Right. You know, they're all hand assembled. They've, they've been in production for, for so long and they're built Since in the Austria. late seventies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a vehicle. I don't know. I'm a car guy. I'm a car guy. Too. I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a traveler first, but I am still a car guy. And the G wagon to me is like, it's the best resto mod vehicle ever made. When you have something that predates was sold at the same time as the FJ 40, right. That you can get with a twin turbo V8 if you want, Yep. you know, with a warranty, you know, we have, I've always had these sugar pumps in my head that I drive around the world in like a one of Jonathan Ward's icon FJs. But what's actually better than that is a new G wagon. Yeah. Um, you have that, that classic shape, that classic, just how you sit in the car, um, an 1800 pound payload, right. Factory winch bumpers available, factory snorkels, factory roof racks, everything. I, I just think, you know, to be honest, the other vehicle that would really be on my list would be a, a Jeep Wrangler, but that roll cage inside makes the inside so space inefficient and efficient and a very, and a very low payload. I mean, yeah. if you took a, a new Rubicon, like Dan Greck's a great example. He's someone that, that used a Wrangler appropriately yes. for long distance travel. Most of the people that I see preparing Wranglers for overland travel overbuild the car, they overweight the car, and then they end up with a lot of problems. And um, we've talked about this before in the podcast, but if you're driving across Australia in an overloaded vehicle, they're going to impound your truck. I mean, I mean, they, in, in very remote places, they have way stations. They do. You know, you will get defected. Your, your vehicle will get towed. Yep. Um, and they're not going to care if it's registered in another country. Yeah, they it's won't. I mean, unsafe. you're just going to have to find, you're going to have to find a dumpster and start unloading stuff that's making yeah. your vehicle, including the rear bumper and the rock sliders and, and all that other stuff. You have to, with the Jeep Wrangler, is the Wrangler even worth talking about now that the Gladiator is available? I mean, yeah, you, I mean, the Gladiator is the I think solution, that's the, I, think. I think if you were to look at, um, I mean, I guess to wrap up on the, on the G-Wagon, the downside of the G-Wagon is it is extremely expensive because of the content that they've chosen to include in the North American market. Yes. And that's the one thing that's disappointing about the G-Wagon. In other markets of the world, you can get a, a 350 Blue Tech diesel model still with cloth interior mm. and where it's decontented. It's the same exact car, yes. same exact diff locks, you know, all of the robustness that comes with a 463 G-Wagon. But it's decontented where it's not only more affordable, it's more efficient. It's easier to, to work on because it's yeah. not so complicated. In North America, we get very complicated, up-contented versions of yes. the G-Wagon. And that, and that is certainly a downside. So you have to make a huge investment. If you look at a new 2019 G550, you're going to spend 160 to 180 grand yeah. if you're lucky, if you can find one. You might have to even pay over MSRP for the car. Yeah, I've I've heard people paying fifty thousand dollars over sticker. Yeah, because that because since that vehicle has that international warranty, they can be exported. Yeah, and that's why they do export them. Yeah, all yeah, over they, the place. Like you, the used vehicles that that we buy. So the United States is the largest market for G wagons. We're also the cheapest place in the world to buy a G wagon. Yep. So you're talking about the the professional edition that 
know, there's no carpet. It's, yep. it's, it's very utilitarian. That vehicle is more expensive in euros converted than a G550 was, sure. at least for the 463. Yeah, sure. Uh, in 2019 in the U.S., they made a, an update to the G-Wagon, added independent front suspension, which still fully locked. It's honestly a better vehicle. Yeah, so like, it, like we've gone through Toyota, Pinnacle Vehicle 200 Series for sure, Mercedes, G-Wagon easily because it's the only option. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with Toyota, you could say, what about the 4Runner? What about, and and it's not to say that a 4Runner isn't appropriate to go around the world. It's that the Land Cruiser is more robust. It's yes. it's also available in nearly every country of the world. And that's why it wins. It, it doesn't mean that a GX 460 isn't a great vehicle. It absolutely is. Yes. And that platform, the 150 platform is used in many countries around yeah, the world. I, I think there's more of an argument for the 460 yeah. than there is for the four for runner. You know, I, I go back to really simple things. What happens when somebody breaks into your car and you need a new driver's side window? That's right. What happens when you um, are driving down a dirt road and a, and a, truck kicks up a massive rock into your windshield and, and, and it's spidered and you, you can't see, like you can't, yeah. like you, you're not going to find a, a windshield or a side window for a, for a for forerunner, a forerunner yeah. anywhere outside of North America. Yeah. I mean, even in Mexico, I think you'd struggle, but again, I mean, that's why those vehicles, you know, they're notable. They're, they're not a terrible choice. They're just nah. not like if you're, if you're setting out to spend a, a long time in the road, you are a legitimate overlander that wants to go experience countries. You don't want to spend a week of your time finding a windshield because it's going to happen. I mean, you know, I remember when you guys did the E seven trucks and they first came over and we were building them, there was multiple windshields in them. Yeah. And I'm like, and that's what occurred to me. I'm like, yeah. Cause if, if you bust a windshield in the U S or Canada, how do you get a new one? How do you get a new one? Yeah. And I, I know people think that those details are small, but it is the small details that really make things. I mean, Jeep Gladiator, you know, the Jeep Wrangler is sold. I mean, I don't want to say everywhere. It's very popular, much more really popular, popular than it used to be. Yeah. Now, once they came out with a four door, it became a solution for a lot of folks. They still haven't been widely adopted in, in places like Australia because it really is Toyota country, but they're very popular in Europe and they're reasonably priced. Um, I actually think that, you know, I think Dan Greck has done a great job of reinforcing why uh, a Jeep is still a good solution. He had very little issues with his, yeah. his vehicle in Africa, no matter what fuel he encountered, he, you know, knew his was a gas model, of course. But if you look at the Gladiator, now the Gladiator solves all the problems because you could put you can put any version of a camper or, a, or just a topper on the back. You can have a 1700 pound payload, which is which is uh, about 600 pounds more than a typical Wrangler. Yeah. Um, 700 pounds in, in, in some cases as well. And a lot of capability. And it's not it's it's a big vehicle, but it's not an overly wide vehicle. It's within a foot of length of my 80 series. Yeah. And, and that's just because, you know, I can fit a 37 inch spare underneath the factory position. Yeah. Uh, if I want to fit a spare that's larger on my 80 series, I've had to buy a Kmart bumper, which sticks out and the tire sticks out more. Yep. You know, like I, if you want to add a winch, you have to add a, a winch bumper, which means that front bumper sticks out a little bit more. Right. They're not, and don't quote me on a foot, but they're not that much different. Yeah. I, I mean, they, they are, they are a long vehicle, but they're still going to fit in a container they're still going to go down most roads in colonial cities because they're not overly wide. Once you get up into full size truck territory, once you, once the yeah. width becomes a consideration, um, like if you, if you look at most small villages in the world or even, even cities, crowded cities in the world, they still need to have service and infrastructure brought into those cities and yes. those villages. And that's where you see the Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Fuso FG. Um, you see um, these medium duty trucks cab over and they're very narrow. They have a huge payload, but they're very narrow yeah, vehicles. Yeah. They're actually narrower than a full size uh, domestic pickup. And that's where the gladiator actually becomes a great choice. Like right now you can buy a three, six gladiator with, you know, a great transmission, 1700 pound payload, Dana 44 axles front and rear. Yeah. Um, it's designed to tow a, a considerable amount of weight. If you chose to, to tow something around the world. Um, I think a gladiator would actually be a great choice to leave. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I think vehicles, you know, 
if you would have asked me to drive a very early JK around the world, maybe I would have had a little bit of anxiety, although Dan Grek didn't have a single issue. Nothing, yeah. Um, 11,000 miles on mine. I mean, in fact, you know, Laura, my partner, she's she's out in New Mexico with the thing right now. And, you know, we get, if if I don't drive aggressively, I can get 17 miles to the gallon on 37s with a camper. That's amazing. Uh, using cheap fuel. And I don't have to worry about diesel exhaust fluid. I don't have to worry about any of those things. It did just come out with a diesel Wrangler and we That's will right. see that engine in the Gladiator. Yep. But other than additional range I, I i don't know i mean that's until, the real until we solve that's that problem with with ultra low sulfur diesel which is going to happen faster than you think um, it will happen quickly and and also you know diesels just they drive great off-road too i mean yeah. they, they develop so much torque at, at low rpms uh throttle modulation and that that ability to kind of effortly cross train i remember just testing the difference between a bison with a diesel and the ZR2 with a gas motor, um, it's it is a lot different. The the tip in with a gas motor is a lot more aggressive. Yeah. It's it's not um, when it's in low range. It's a lot more difficult to modulate. Yeah, um, diesels are just a pleasure to drive. Yeah, yeah, especially small displacement turbo diesels, uh, which is just a, a type of motor that I've come to love mm. personally. Um, and you know, you know, it's it's a little bit sad. We've got the Chevrolet Bison now, which has front and rear lockers, is fantastic suspension, you know, a 1500 pound payload and a diesel motor. And you'd kind of think for a second, like, oh, is that actually the best choice to drive around the world? And for like this hot minute, it's probably not. You're probably better off getting a gas version of the yeah, same truck. But but here's the cool thing is in in five years when the entire world, yeah, now this is hypothetical, it's on ultra low sulfur diesel because it's, it's happening. Eventually you'll hit a critical mass where the refineries oh, yeah. won't, they just, they won't have the economy of scale to make these countries. I mean, you know, Venezuela and that kind of stuff. They're going to, they're going to do their own thing, but you know, imagine in five years when that bison's 20 grand. Yeah. And be such a great choice. Just buy it and go. I mean, yep. you know, the, the sprinter, I, I, I so wish a sprinter could be on here. Yeah. Um, but you know, they have the, They're worth talking about for sure. Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure they're super popular. I'm sure the there's world. a solution from the factory to, to, to get rid of that requirement for the ad blue and, or the deaf, um, you know, that the sprinter is great because you have interior living space, which is huge. Right. And I think they're a realistic look at the capability you'll actually need from a four wheel drive system while you're overlanding. I, I, you know, I think there's specific trips that require, you know, maybe something a little bit more technically capable. Um, but for most people, 90% of the time you're going to be on roads. You know, you're, you're, you're tackling, you know, roads that people are driving in regular cars every day. Um, I just think the sprinter is super realistic. I think if I was to do it all over again and I wasn't going to do a gladiator and I was, it was just a North American truck. I think I would do a sprinter and I would do one of those Winnebago rebels. I know there's cool. some things I'd have to fix on it. Yeah, sure. Um, but you know, I, I know people that are trying to get their sprinters built by independent companies and they're, Two hundred thousand dollars and a two-year wait list. I can go buy a brand new Revel right now for one hundred and twenty grand. Yeah, I like the idea of um, of getting the Sprinter um, and then and then doing some off-road modifications to it, and then slowly building out the interior. Yeah, uh, based upon what I find my needs really are. Yeah, um, I think I would probably go that route, and I think part of it is because I love the idea of being able to load a motorcycle up in the back. Yes. So like, so ha or, or anything, go to home Depot or whatever. Um, it's kind of what I use. The really practical. It's kind of what I use the defender for now. It's, <laughs> it's like my home Depot truck, but um, you know, it's re it is really practical. And I, and I do like the sprinter. It's, it's funny. Um, you know, the more that I travel, the more I realize like the idea of being able to retreat in from bad weather um, is appealing. And that's where, that's where the camper, at least for me as a, as a traveler starts to, to make a lot more sense is, you know, having been in really crappy weather in Iceland for days and days and days yeah. at a time or in, you know, pick any other country. Um, it, it is fatiguing when you can't get away from that. And, and something like a sprinter is a pretty awesome way to do it. Yeah. I mean, close the door, you're done. Yeah. Um, you could park it in a city, you know, people are going to know, I mean, guys, the, the, like I, I used to live in Fruita, Colorado. It's like a mountain bike van life Mecca. Yeah. And 
you know, they, they all kind of roll in and are like, Oh, I'm in my white sprinter. People think it's just a delivery van. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Like, yeah. A delivery van with like brand new BF Goodrich all terrains and a winch bumper. Yeah. Yeah. Like delivery. Yeah. There's no such thing as a $200,000 custom delivery van. Yeah, like that's that. right. But I, I think the idea of, of the, the stealth camping where nobody really knows, you know, unless you're putting Bob's plumbing on the side, that ship has sailed ships sailed, especially 10 years ago, you could get away from it, get, get away with it. But there's a, been a lot of like counter movement in this, like boondocking and yeah. Yeah. And people just camping wherever they want and tell your ride right on the street. I mean, but a van, a van is a great way to do that. Cause it is much lower profile. Once you set up a roof tent, it's yeah, very, it's and very I think it's, I think it's like, Probably if you're going to do it, the most respectful way to do it, as long as, you know, you're self-contained. Yeah. Um, you know, people, oh, what's the, what's the problem with me camping yeah. there? Well, there's no problem with you camping there. It's just the fluids that have to find a way. Yeah, that's to, right. You know, somewhere. So totally. Um, but I do, I do like the idea of the sprinter and they are very popular all over the world. They're, yeah. they're, they're sold in, in most countries. Uh, there is good dealer infrastructure and support. Um, and you do, especially in, in other countries, you will fly a little more under the radar, um, yeah. when you're just driving down the road, it's not going to be this like amazing gladiator on 37s. That's going to yeah, be, that's the problem. That's my biggest problem with the G wagon. I think is, I mean, I, I could imagine driving like a flat, flat black twin turbo G wagon or something in Uganda and maybe that's not the nicest thing to do. Maybe not, <laughs> maybe not, but it, it's also very effective too. Yeah. I mean, they're. Anyone, anyone in Uganda that drives a matte black G wagon is someone that no one's going to mess with. Yeah. Like, it, like even someone that doesn't know what a G wagon is knows what a truck like that means. Um, like if you go into Russia, I mean, I guess the only problem you'd have in Russia is that the, the other guy with a matte black G wagon <laughs> might think you're encroaching on his territory. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, there, there is at times there is an advantage to driving a vehicle that's highly disruptive, right. Mm. Um, where, because, um, and I'm not advocating for, for the, for the display of wealth or luxury. That's not at all what I'm saying. It's, it's about being disruptive as a traveler. Um, when you come into an area with high security problems, um, <clears throat> like what we did with expedition seven is we had several identically placarded vehicles that looked like an NGO or it looked like an ambulance. Yeah. You know, it had a large Chevron on the door. It had Chevrons down the side that looked very much like an ambulance. Um, the whole idea, it, it's not to be deceptive. It's just to be disruptive enough where the local criminal doesn't try it. They don't even yeah. make an effort to do a carjacking or a break into your vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, and, and I think we should talk about the Tacoma and like the frontier too. Like these aren't bad choices. I wouldn't no, not consider at all. them pinnacle choices. I know, I know I'll have a million people on the internet yell at me if I don't say that you know, the Tacoma is an option. And it has been an option for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, they, they are still popular to use for international travel. Um, they're a gasoline engine. Yes. Um, very reliable platform overall. Um, there are some functional issues with the vehicle that make it perform at a standard that I consider below pinnacle now. Um, yeah. Primarily the, the transmission ratio choices that Toyota yeah, went with. Yeah. Um, it, it Once you start to load them up, um, I would actually almost say that they're dangerous, um, you know, because they just don't, they don't respond properly um, when you're trying to make a left-hand turn. For example, if they're totally stock, um, they accelerate fine and you don't yeah, even notice yeah. it. But once you start to put them at, at payload, at maximum payload, um, they respond much differently, even with stock, stock diameter tires. Yeah, I, I think Nitro recommends like 488s for them or yeah. something. And I think they have 373s. I mean, that's a, that's a significant jump yeah. in gearing. And that's what it needs. And, and all Toyota really needs to do with the vehicle is just adjust the first and second gear ratios. Yeah. Um, you know, the first gear ratio on the Tacoma transmission is in the high threes. And whereas the, the gladiator is a five to one first gear. Yeah. It's an enormous difference. Yeah. Um, and that results in driver confidence. Like as um, manufacturers, um, they, I think they've lost the way on how the, how the vehicles interact with the driver. Um, when a vehicle does certain things right, it gives the driver confidence and that yeah. gives the, the person, it inspires them to buy another one. Um, it gives them a good experience while they're driving it. Um, and that first and second gear ratio choice um, on the newest model Tacoma was a miss. 
Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that I hold out for the Tacoma is that that is the, the first generation, I guess, of, of the third generation, even though yeah. it's really close to the second generation. I think that's also True. a failing Toyota had. Um, you know, there's always the glimmer of hope they'll go to a world model because the Hilux internationally, when that received its update, um, that was essentially a, you know, a rebody of the, of, of the previous generation. Um, so, you know, if Toyota threw an eight speed in that instead of a six speed, yep. they'd probably Problem solve solved. a lot of their problems. Problem solved. Uh, you know, if they added 20 horsepower, yep. problem solved. I mean, 20 like, foot pounds of torque is what I'd take. Yeah. First. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is going to happen. I think yeah. that's where I'm excited for the Tacoma yeah. is it, it's inevitable. I mean, they're going to have to give it a little bit more power and they're, they know that they have a, a maybe an issue, but. I mean, that they sell like hotcakes. So do yeah, they actually they, have an issue? They sell 200,000 units a year. Um, it's a, it's a very logical choice for a lot of people. I think, I think it's, it's, it's curious because people who are listening to this podcast that own a Tacoma will probably feel like we're uh, being critical of their car. What's actually happened. The thing that's changed is that we have options now. Yeah. So, um, the third generation Tacoma, if it was out five years ago, it would, it would still be like, we would have it on this list. We would say it's a pinnacle truck, but if you were to compare it against, um, against the new Bison, um, the new Bison is a better vehicle. If you yeah. compare it against the Gladiator, the Gladiator is a better vehicle. Now I'm not saying that they're more reliable, even though there are a lot of reliability indicators that, that do, um, speak very positively of the GM products now. Um, I, I think that the Tacoma just now has a lot of competition and Toyota's a, an incredible brand. They're going to figure it out. They're going to be like, all right, sales are starting to shift towards our competitors. Um, we're losing market share. Yeah. We, we have an opportunity to tune the vehicle in a way now that addresses those competitive pressures. Yeah. And, and I think that they're, they're very expensive. They are. Um, yeah. well, not, comp- I mean. No, so no, the guy who just bought a Gladiator. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So that's what everybody says to me, right? So my full disclosure, my Gladiator has all the leather. It's loaded, whatever. I'm not saying this to gloat. Just as a position thing, it was 62. I think it was the only model, though, that you could buy that It was the only that model early, that I could buy that, that, you early. Could buy that early. My, yeah. my VIN's very, very early. But I have a winch-compatible steel front bumper that yep. has wings that can be removed. I have a four-to-one low range. I have locking differentials front and rear. Um, you know, it came with Fox shocks that has sliders. It has a steel rear bumper with sliders. Um, you know what? And, and it came with four 11s, which for up to 35s is totally sufficient. What would it cost you if, if you're going to go down the more modified four wheel drive route? What would, uh, you know, and, and this is the Rubicon. So it has the appearance stuff. It has the hood. What would it cost for you to put a TRD pro, which is 45 grand mm-hmm. and they're selling, I, I believe still selling for over sticker for mm-hmm. some reason. Um, you know, oh, they're a great truck. They're a great truck, but yeah. 45, 50 grand. And then you add what's a bumper cost. What's what do sliders cost? Yeah. What is a rear bumper cost? Cause you're going to have to mount that tire somewhere. And then you're mm-hmm. going to have to, you're going to have to re gear. I, the gladiator becomes a value. Yeah, it does. And and I think the only the only thing that gives it a little bit of a challenge is the bison because the bison's uh, about seven thousand dollars less. Yeah. Yeah. And it does. Sure. Ha- and it does have front and rear lockers and even a diesel engine. Which, yeah. You know, yeah. the Gladiator will come out with soon enough. But, you know, when we think about these pinnacle vehicles, uh, when you look at a pickup, I would I would be really inclined um you know, if I was going to look at a, a midsize truck, I'd be really inclined towards a bison with a gasoline motor right now. Um, that would probably be what I would take around the world. Um, and and another option I would seriously consider would be a Frontier. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're affordable. They're so affordable. They're a global platform. Yeah, they are. I mean, a lot has changed with the Navara and other markets. And and I know that Nissan is is right at the doorstep of a model change uh, for that vehicle as well. But um, it is the most reliable vehicle of its class in the U.S. right yeah, now. It's the- more reliable than the Tacoma, has fewer problems thousand vehicles um it is it is a much better choice it for mystifies me why the new navara over yeah. you know overseas is not sold here because they're yeah. you know the d40 i want to say yeah. that the what we're still getting is you know, that hasn't been sold overseas for some time. Long time i went to the press launch for the new navara in australia in 2015 um you know and yeah. i was told there would be in the u.s and you know 
a year or so. But that that chassis is phenomenal. It's coil sprung in the rear. Yeah, it's really well balanced. I mean, it's so good. It's actually what what Mercedes chose to base their X class off of. And Mercedes is very crazy, particular, crazy yeah. particular with 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 dynamics. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of really good choices out there. There are. I think um, the the interesting thing about the Frontier when I was talking with some of the program managers recently is um, they're selling more of them than they have even three years ago. So yeah. like they sell, they sell almost 80,000 frontiers a year. That's a yeah. lot. That's a lot of on trucks. a car that they did their tooling 15 years ago. Yeah. On, yeah they know? sell twice as many frontiers as Ford sells Rangers. Yeah. Um, and that's because they, they come across as very, as a great value. They come across as very honest. They come across as very capable. You can get a pro four X with a rear locker yeah, and, yeah. and uh, a large diameter tire. It has a, a larger displacement engine that has the best torque in its class. Um, and these are, these are a lot of things that compel people to buy them. And, and if you go onto the website and you look at the MSRP, that is, they sell for much less than that. Yeah. So yeah, like if you go to the sticker it, for a Tacoma, yeah, you're going to pay sticker for a Tacoma. You're going to pay three to five grand off sticker for a frontier and, and that's, Colorado that and starts, a Ranger starts to be very, very compelling as far as a value. Um, well, let's talk about full-size trucks. What do you think? Is yeah, there I mean, anything I mean, that it, falls in that category? If anymore? We, if we set aside that, that ultra low sulfur diesel thing and the diesel exhaust fu- fluid thing. Yeah. The, the F two fifty is a great choice. I mean, I, I took mine everywhere. I mean, it's big, yeah. But I always said, if she fits, she gets, <laughs> like, um, you know, you can put massive tires on those things. They have the drive line, you know, a lot of times even with large tires, they don't really require gearing. Sure. Um, you know, I, but I think of full size trucks and, and then there's the F one fifty. I mean, you know, a, a very solid choice would be buy an F one fifty, throw a four wheel camper in the back and just go. Yeah. Um, but the Rams fantastic. I mean, you can actually buy a Ram that I don't want to say bypasses the the def because it still has def. Mario just bought that. It yeah, was the an commercial ambulance chassis, commercial yeah. chassis. It will run completely legally since it is a commercial vehicle. It won't go into limp home mode, which can be can be super valuable. Yeah. Um, you know, it has two fuel tanks. I want to say it was like I think he paid forty grand for that thing. Yeah. With the under fifty Cummins grand. diesel, and now you're going to have to do some modification to that, but. If you're, if you're going to do a flatbed or, or anything like that, um, you know, those are great. Yeah. Ch- you can check his out. AT Overland, um, he has big boxes on it. Yep. Um, that'll be an interesting project to watch. I mean, you know, going back to SEMA, uh, my favorite truck at SEMA was, was AEV's new 2,500 yeah, Prospector so in that so cool sweet. green color, the yeah. bumper. They finally did a little bit more brush guard style, yeah. which I like for animal strike protection. Um, Man, that was really cool. Totally agree. New new rear bumper, spare tire mount. Um, that thing looked literally ready to go around yeah, the world. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing I say about the full-size trucks uh, in comparison to my Gladiator, um, where do you put that tire? You have to have a bumper or something. Yeah. It's funny that my Gladiator will fit a 37 underneath yeah. and a full-size truck won't. Right. You know, uh, a friend of mine has a you know wedge-style camper on his 2500. Now he's a six-and-a-half-foot bed. I have a five foot bed on my gladiator, but I have completely vertical walls and I don't have to have my tire inside the bed. Right. So, you know, granted you could do a swing away, but swing aways are kind of few and far between for full size trucks. And there's a lot of details in the gladiator that I, I really respect. Yeah. I mean, it shows, I mean, Mark Allen, obviously it comes, comes back to the guy that's in charge of design and Mark Allen is an overlander. He does it. Uh, he does it. Like he's been a subscriber to overland journal since the very beginning. Um, so he, you know, and he looks at all of that, like, how do I fit a 37 in the stock location? Yeah. How do I make sure that it has the right payload? How do I make sure that the vehicle can be easily modified? Yep. Um, and when you've got a, an organization that has people in charge that get it, you end up with vehicles like the Gladiator, which are an awesome choice. Yeah. Like I was just on the, I probably mentioned this was on the Rubicon maybe a, a few months ago with Mark and uh, yeah. all, uh, some of the engineering team, like you can't fake driving skill. Like I, I, I've, you know, we've both been on a lot of trails with designers and, and, you know, some are in velvet shoes selling four wheel drives and some are in hiking boots yeah. spotting you. Yeah. And I think that's, what's cool about, about Jeep. Totally. Um, yeah, totally. You know, 
All right. So the, I guess the other elephant in the room is we haven't talked about Land Rover yet. Does Land Rover currently sell a vehicle that you think is a pinnacle vehicle, something you'd drive around the world? You know, we'll, we'll find out because obviously we're going to drive the uh, the Defender soon in, in Namibia, which I think is uh, you don't send a car to Namibia if you're not trying to make a statement that yeah. it is um, that it is worthwhile. Um, but I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with 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 Land Rover. Um, I think they make fantastic vehicles for normal people. Yeah. That's the problem is they're for normal people. Um, it, 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 it It wouldn't. Would I love to drive a Range Rover around the world? Yeah. Would I actually choose that over, you know, some of the other pinnacle vehicles we've mentioned? I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I think I've lost a lot of confidence um, in Land Rover as, as far as a, you know, an international vehicle. Um, there's just so many systems, you know, like the, the 200 series and the G class, those are luxury vehicles, right? But underneath, they're being used on mines somewhere. Yep. A Range Rover is not being used as a mine foreman's truck or a military vehicle anywhere. Right. I mean, maybe it's some general's vehicle in a yeah. country, but sure. You know, he has an army behind him to fix it. Right. Um, they're they're great vehicles. They're they're insanely capable off road for what they are. Right. But I feel like they're more like an X5 these days, and I wouldn't drive an X5 around the world. Yeah, you can definitely see that the the priority for the organization has shifted towards making a premium luxury SUV. And their sales uh, have skyrocketed because yeah, of it. I mean, that's, that's the right. thing. Can I, you I, can I, you fault I, it for fault them yeah, for it? I, I don't always, know. Yeah. I always give Land Rover, you know, enthusiasts a little bit of grief. I mean, I I'm I love Land Rover. We're both into this because of Land Rover, totally, right? Like 100%. I've owned a bunch of them. They're they're some of the most emotional vehicles I've ever I've oh, yeah. ever driven or owned. Um, but Land Rover enthusiasts don't buy new cars. Yeah. Like I, I don't know. I, I don't know a single person with a discovery five right now that right. is taking it off road. Right. I know a lot of people with LR threes and LR fours. And back in the day, I knew a lot of people with D ones and D twos. Um, but they bought but them used typically. Their second, third, fourth owner vehicles. Yeah. And unfortunately like for Land Rover owners, they don't come out of the the factory with a hundred thousand miles for 10 grand. Right. They're, they're expensive cars. They depreciate rapidly. Um, you I mean, you could certainly argue that buying a used Land Rover is the only way to buy a Land Rover. I mean, you can buy it, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's just a different, they have a different goal. Yeah. And, and if you look at like Range Rover now is very much luxury, um, uh, you know, the discovery is very much like this family and they're doing well. They're actually selling quite yeah. well, but you know, they're, they're like this, this family truckster that has really good snow capability and you could take it camping and everything like that. Uh, but it, they, it does seem like they're, they're trying to make a statement around utility yeah. um, and durability with, with the new defender. Now you and I have seen the vehicle in person. We spent a lot of time with the car, um, we, un- we spent a lot of time with the engineers, so we know their intentions behind it. And I think their intentions are, are at least of the engineering team, I think are quite good. Um, I think they missed the mark on some of the styling with the front end, but, um, you know, the, the engineering for a modern vehicle, yeah. their intentions are, are good. Um, but once we get it out in the deserts of Namibia, we'll have a, a much better idea how, I, I how think the vehicle, vehicle in softer terrain will perform fantastically yeah um uh, you know that much power and sand dunes with what is phenomenal suspension for for something like that yeah it's going to be really cool a low center of gravity you know they have they have a roof tent that'll be available for it high roof load i, I would love high payload time, too high payload. Pound payload i would love this time next year to revisit this and I, I i i i'm rooting so hard for land rover to be on this list yeah i just you know underneath you know, we, I, I kind of drilled one of their engineers on this. Okay. How is this different than a discovery five? And they told me that ball joint was five millimeters larger on the lower control arm. Yeah. Okay. You know, a, a discovery five wouldn't work for me. It's going to take a lot to, um, to convince me that, you know, the, the changes that they have made. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is, is look at, look at the defender as an entirely new model. I think once you yeah. attach the name defender to it, it brings all of this heritage and legacy and passion that came with the original car. Yeah. Um, and for me, it starts to taint my judgment on being able to assess the vehicle. Um, 
you know, because I, I have a defender and I've driven defenders all over the world and I, I have a lot of passion for that model. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to come into it with fresh eyes, but let's see, let's give it, let's give it some time and see where it yeah, goes. Yeah. I mean, I, if it was the new discovery, it would be the world's best discovery yeah, I know, ever. I know. Um, yeah, I know. You know. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, um, cause I owned a Mark three Range Rover and it was an, it was one of my favorite vehicles for what it was. And it reminds me of like, I just got a super utility version of a Mark three Range Rover, yeah, yeah. which, which to me seems exciting. Um, and it seems, it seems honest and it seems appropriate. Um, as a defender, time's going to tell if it's going to be a good replacement for that vehicle. I had somebody say to me recently, looks cool. What does it do for me that an LR4 doesn't for 15 grand? Right. Um, you know, and that's that repetitive cycle of the Land Rover thing is why would, why would you buy one? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, that'll be an interesting one to see as the, as time develops, right? Yeah. And then, you know, internationally, we, we kind of touched on it. You know, there's, there's some obvious choices for Pinnacle vehicles, 70 series. You know, we put the, the defenders on that list with it the is. new Puma motor. It drives great. I think it has a Mustang transmission. Now it's kind of cobbled together from Ford. What was the um, last year of that car? 2016. 16. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, I mean, one of our, one of our thoughts with this pinnacle vehicle list was vehicles that were available within the last 10 years. So relatively new. Yeah. Um, and you can, you can find a 463 G wagon, which is what we'd recommend a 461 G wagon. Another great recommendation, a Y61 patrol. Yeah. Um, you can highly find underrated. Yeah. Highly underrated. You can find that, that vehicle. Um, they're still being sold in Saudi Arabia. They're being sold as the as the Gazelle and as the Falcon and 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 yeah. other other models that With are massive like gas engines in them. That yeah, they, they are supercharged and turbocharged and do all kinds of things too. That's right. Yeah. So the Y sixty one Patrol is still a great consideration. Obviously, any variant of the 70 series is going to be really worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and particularly if you buy it with the the one eight Z. Now, um, I like the motor, the VDJ, a lot. Um, yeah. but the 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 one eight Z is is a motor that's it's understressed all the time. Yeah. If you're driving by yourself it's or with really your partner, slow and you're not yeah, you just not you're not gonna be in a rush. But we had one, I mean, that was what was in my 70 and yep. my troopy, I should say our troopy. Um and it was fine. Yeah, I just totally I wouldn't want to drive one in the United States. No, it'd be brutal on the United States. I mean, but I think once you get out of the US, like it doesn't, it just doesn't really matter. matter. It just you're not matter. going as fast. Um yeah, it just doesn't matter. You know, and, and just to touch on why we're why we're focusing on things that are in the last 10 years is is one, I think we want to reward companies for making, you know, we, we want to give them a nod for continuing to make these vehicles, but you know, vehicles are quite reliable. Yeah. Right. Right anymore. now. Yeah. Um, you know, again, we talked about the 80 series. Yes. The 80 series is very reliable. So is the 200 series, but you're not going to find an 80 for under 15 grand that has under 200,000 miles right now. It's tough. Like, like you, you are at the point where it's, it, even if you find a low mileage vehicle, you still, you, you've timed out on things. Like you yeah. said, the rubber, the gaskets, that kind of stuff, electrical wiring, they're just not going to be as reliable. You, yep. I mean, you have to want to drive that vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's my choice. Yeah. I mean, that's one I'll actually do it in. Um, but I've, I've spent a gladiator and refurbishment and purchase price on, on that vehicle. And there's a lot of advantage to leaving on a big trip. That's important to you. I mean, if you, if you think about most people that are doing a big overland journey, um, they call it the trip of their lifetime, right? And that's because um, in many cases, it's the only trip that they will do like that in their life. Yeah. So you want you want to pad the experience in as many ways as you can. Modern vehicles are more safe. Yes. Um, they have airbags. They have better handling. They have better stopping performance. Uh, they have advanced ABS. They have vehicle stability control. Um, and it's, it's very easy for like the curmud curmudgeon like old timer to say, ah, oh, you don't need those systems. Well, it's, they, they say you don't need those systems because they don't understand how well they work yeah. and how many lives that they've like, actually Like saved. how much fatigue is reduced by radar cruise control yeah. at, at, at no compromise on, on my Jeep, for example, like, you know, we just drove to Overland Expo East and back that was, and it was almost 7,000 mile road trip. If I was in my Land Cruiser, I would have been able to do half the distance. I, right. I maybe not half, but yeah, you know, a, significant, significant impact to the distance, right? That you can drive in a day. So driver fatigue is really important. Safety of yourself and your family members or your loved ones that you have along with you or your best buddies that you've got along on yeah. this 
amazing trip, why not make it safer? Why not make it more fuel efficient? Why not reduce the impact to the environment because of emissions? All of those things that modern vehicles have, um, it's easy to just take this puritanical approach of like, or it's you know it's not an eighty series, so I don't want it. I don't think that that works anymore. I think we have no. to. I think we have to be open minded to the fact that technologies have changed. Um, vehicles have gotten better in many ways. Uh, you know, a, a two thousand and nineteen uh, Wrangler is the most capable Wrangler ever made. Yeah. Um, you know, you can. Lo- I can look back at my CJ seven that I had, and a new a new Rubicon would run circles around that truck. 100%. Would run absolutely. And that's the cool. It. That's the cool thing with. The Wrangler, it's the only vehicle I know of that each year becomes more it capable. It just gets better and better. You know, it just gets better and better. Uh, obviously, people get, you know, stuck on their model and JK guys are like, oh, the JL's soft. Well, stop saying that because then in five years, you're going to be driving a JL and well, you're going to be stoked about yeah, it. Yeah, what in most cases, what they're saying when they're being critical of a new model is that they can't afford it. So now I've got to pick it apart so that I feel better about the fact yeah. that I can't afford it. Um, but those are, like you said, those are the folks that in 10 years, they'll be buying that vehicle because it'll be within their yeah. price range. And it isn't, doesn't mean that new vehicles don't have faults. They certainly yeah. do. But if you look at the Bison, it's the most capable midsize truck that GM has ever produced. Yes. And it's available today. The Gladiator is the is the Jeep pickup that we've always wanted, of course, inspired heavily by AEV's Brute. Um, but the Gladiator is it's the most capable Jeep pickup ever produced. Yeah. And it's available today. Uh, totally. The G-Wagon, um, the new model G-Wagon still has triple differential locks. Um, the 200 series is still one of, it's the, as the engineer said, the most durable Land Cruiser they've ever made. So it's, it's really easy to be dismissive of modern vehicles, but I think in many cases they're listening to consumer need and they're responding with trucks that people are passionate about. People are going to have the car companies are going to have to specialize. Yeah. Will people like, will the need for a Hyundai Elantra exit Elantra? I don't know. know Say it, whatever (laughs) that thing is, whatever it is, (laughs) whatever the cheap Hyundai or the cheap Kia or whatever, you know, is that, that's just going to be absorbed by ride sharing. It's going to be a commodity rental yeah. cars or that kind of thing. So I think if these car companies want to exist, I think a lot of them are on the right path. Jeep yep. in particular. Yeah. Build vehicles that people are passionate about, build vehicles that solve problems. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about a lot of those today. Those exist. These pinnacle vehicles are still available to us and we encourage doing some research. I mean, don't yeah. just listen to what Matt and I are saying. It, it, this is based on our own experience, but a vehicle like a 200 series, when you look at the aftermarket options that are available for it and the global service, it's a very compelling choice. Yes. Right on, man. Well, we, yeah, we got a couple trips coming up. we got Africa. Yeah. I'm, I'm spending about a month in Baja in a few weeks. Yeah. And perfect. then Africa. And I think we're going to try and do something, maybe yeah. Botswana, South Africa. Yeah, that's right. In February. Yeah. Go do some adventuring. And then uh, Alaska, Yukon, Northern Territories for me, probably two months next year. Hopefully leaving right after Overland Expo to avoid some of the mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love so. it. I love it. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you for spending time with us on the Overland Journal podcast. Um, I'm your host, Scott Brady. You can find me on Instagram at Overland Journal. Um, you can find me at, at Global Overland. And then we've got Matt Scott. Where can people find you? Yeah, so you can find my sarcastic ramblings on Instagram at, at Matt Explore. Follow me or don't. Or don't know. <laughs> you're gonna see you're gonna see a lot of cool trucks and also a lot of pictures of my Greyhound. So yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Tell people about uh, about your Greyhound. I think it's oh, important. Man. Yeah. So this is it. little Dakar. He's he's actually he's silent. He's just been hanging out here. You probably didn't even know he was here. Yeah. Super passionate about about rescuing Greyhounds. Um, I can't tell you how how much of a positive influence this dog has been in my life. It's been a great experience. There's dogs out there that need homes. You know, this guy. He's a little bit of separation anxiety and that kind of stuff, but so he's sweet. awesome. He's never, never chewed anything up. You know, we had him for two months and we took him to Baja for three weeks in the back of a land cruiser. And he, I think these dogs are just, they're, I don't know. I, I would say greyhounds are very appreciative dogs. Yeah. You and know? they, and they need homes. They need homes. So, yeah, so, so maybe have a take look. a look, take a look at that. It's when you holidays. look at your, yeah. When you look at your 200 series, switch over to another browser window and start looking for greyhounds. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Everybody have a great week. Yeah. Take care guys.